Welcome to Word Connect with Pastor Maxwell Ogaga, a teaching ministry where believers are trained to be established in the truth of God's Word. For more information and free downloads, please visit www.thepastormax.ng. We established or we, we concluded last uh, Sunday that when Adam sinned against God by disobeying God, he died spiritually. And we proved that from the scriptures. And we said that all men were dead men. They were conceived in sin and trespasses. And this was not just about whether somebody was morally good or not. This was the fact that there was the sin nature in man. Praise God. And that's why, for those of you who have children, you will realize that you don't need to teach your child how to lie. <clears throat> right? You don't need to teach your child how to be stingy. In fact, you can have a little child and you buy uh, biscuits for them or ice cream for them. And in that same moment, you just stretch your hands to them and say, can I have some? And what are they going to do? Come on now. What are they going to do? You know what they are going to do because you did it to your mother. Come on now. What are they going to do? They're going to put their hands back. Who taught them not to give? Do you know that people have to be taught to give? Because naturally, the human nature is stingy. Glory to God. The human nature hates. The human nature is wicked. So when you're born again, that's why I'm, I'm always a strong proponent of the fact that grace teaches a man to deny ungodliness. If you're born again, there's got to be difference in your life. The grace of God doesn't just make your spirit safe. It will renew your conduct. Praise God. So we established that. Now, I, I've been saying something in between the messages, and I want you to pay attention to it. The fact that the whole of the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation talks about Jesus Christ. In fact, when you go to the book of Revelation, the Bible says this is the revelation of Jesus Christ given to John the Apostle. It's not the revelation of the beast or the Antichrist. Praise the name of the Lord. Come and I said, praise the name of the Lord. So you must realize that. That this is uh, essentially a book talking about Jesus and talking about salvation. So let me give you two scriptures towards that again. Let's go to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. It says, And from childhood you have known the Holy Scripture. Okay? Which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in what? Jesus Christ. So it says, You have known the Holy Scriptures. Okay? So, I'm using the, the New American Standard to teach right, right, right about this, this time. The New American Standard said, And from childhood, you have known the sacred writings, which is the Holy Scriptures, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul was talking to Timothy, and I, we, we need to understand this. Paul was talking to Timothy. He says, From childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures. Now, from the age of 12, Jesus began to talk about the scriptures with uh, the rulers of the synagogue, right? And about the age of 30, Jesus actually entered into ministry at the age of 30 and finished ministry at the age of 33. Now, it's been proven through church history and theology that the oldest of the disciples was just a little above older than Jesus, maybe like 33 or 34. He should be Peter because Peter was married and Peter had a mother-in-law. That's why Peter cannot be the pope of the, of the first church. Because fathers don't marry, Peter married. Okay? Now... The disciples of Jesus were actually about teenagers. About 17, 18, 19, 20, thereabout. That was their age. And that's why sometimes, for, for we need to also understand something, because sometimes we think our children are too young to know the Holy Scriptures. And so we, we give them all the soft spot, the twinkle, twinkle, little star, the, um, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And before we know, they are, hit, they are in the university or in schools, and they are faced with all kinds of things, and they were not prepared. Actually, uh, from the Hebrew point of view, from the age of 9 and 10, the children were already taught to memorize scripture. 
And that's why at the age of 12, Jesus was talking with the rulers of the synagogue. He wasn't just doing that because he was God. Are you following this now? Come on, talk to me. Are you following this now? So he says, from a little child. And so we recognize from the life of Timothy that his parents were deliberate about teaching him scriptures which led him to the knowledge of salvation. You must understand that Timothy's father was Greek. So his mother and his grandmother played a role in the transference of faith in him. But what I want you to pick there is that you have known the scriptures which is able to lead you to the knowledge of salvation. So the scriptures were to lead people to the knowledge of salvation. And we must be very clear about that. We can talk about breakthroughs and healing and deliverance, but essentially the scriptures are to lead us to the knowledge of what? Of salvation. Can you say loud amen? Now, if you go to John chapter 1, let me show you something here. John chapter 1, let's go to verse 45. John chapter 1, verse 45. John chapter 1 and verse 45. Pay attention to all of these scriptures. Go back home, meditate, meditate on them, spend time to study them again. John chapter 1, verse 45. It says, now let's read from verse 44. Now Philip was from Bethsaida of the city of Andrew and Peter. Verse 45, look at this. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him, look at this, of whom Moses in the law. And also the prophets wrote. Look at that. Look at that. When they found Jesus, what did they say? They said, We have found the man of whom what? Come on, talk to me, church. Of whom what? Moses in the law and what? And the prophets wrote. So what was, what was, um, um, Philip saying, what was Philip saying here? He says, when we read Moses and when we read the prophet, he was telling us about a particular man. And we found that man. So they were able, listen carefully, they were able to identify Jesus as the Messiah because of what they read in the law and the prophets. So when they read the law, listen carefully, listen very, very carefully, don't miss this. If I was teaching the teenage class, I would say, hold your ears, but don't do that now. But listen carefully to this now. <clears throat> when they read the scriptures, they were not looking for breakthrough. When they read the scripture, they were not looking for what God can do for them. When they picked up the law of Moses, they were reading to identify the Messiah. The goal of the scriptures essentially was for them to identify who is the Messiah. Because that was all what Israel was looking for. The, the whole thing that Israel was looking for was salvation. Now, in their mind, they thought it was going to be physical salvation to save them from the hands of the Roman emperors. But when they read the book of Moses and they saw things in the book of Moses, the things they read in the book of Moses was to help them identify the Messiah. And I'm going to talk about that today essentially because even john the baptist did not know jesus he john the baptist did not know jesus by revelation he knew jesus only as jesus was being baptized that a sign was going to come so the baptism of john was primarily to identify jesus and his mission are you still here philip <laughs> found nathaniel and said to him we well, found him of whom moses in the law and also the prophets wrote Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Pay attention to that title. Pay attention to that title. Pay. You see, when you read the scripture, you pay attention to details. We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. So the law and the prophets were writing about Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, pause on the son of Joseph. Hold your place there. Go to Luke chapter 3, verse 38. Show you something here. Luke chapter 3 and verse 38. Hallelujah. All right. Don't worry, you're in small Bible school now. Just follow. Luke chapter 3, verse 38. See this here now. It says, He was talking about, mm, go to verse 23. Go to verse 23. When he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age. Being as was supposed, the son of Joseph, you, okay? Then he talked about the son of Eli, all right? Now, he says Jesus started his ministry at the age of 30. Now, the reason is because uh, the, 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 
priest, they were to start functioning in the temple from the age of 30. From the age of 30, that's when they, they, they can actually start functioning in the temple. So that's why Jesus started his ministry there. Now, go to verse 38. I want to show you something in verse 38. So he lists all the sons and all the generations. And he says, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Did you see that there? Did you see that there? What are you looking for there now? Adam was called the son of God. So what you find out is that Adam was created in the image of God and was called the son of God. But he failed, of course, the temptation. And so Jesus also came to the earth as the son of God. Now listen to this. Jesus had to come in two natures. He has to come as God, sinless, but he also has to come as man. Because if for God to be able to redeem man, remember our quote by C.S. Lewis, the son of God became the son of man so that the sons of men can do what? Can become what? Come and talk to me now. Can become what? The son of... Yeah, so he had to take in our nature. We're going into why Jesus came now. He had to take in our nature because Adam is the son of God. So the fact that Adam failed didn't mean that God denied him. <laughs> <laughs> All right? So, there are actually only two men in this world. They are either sons of God or, yeah, in terms of the first Adam and the second Adam. So, the first Adam was the Adam that failed, that carried the sin nature, the human nature, and then there's the second Adam. Now, the, the, the scripture actually uses the word the last Adam. It didn't use the word the second Adam because there's not going to be any third Adam. Okay? So, it's the first and the last Adam. Why is it the last Adam? Because he is the one that God had brought for the salvation of mankind. That's why the scripture says that there is salvation in no other name except in the name of Jesus. And then we have to be careful because we see things today when people write in the name of tolerance that we are all worshipping the same God but different names. That's a lie. We're not all worshipping the same God. And I'm going to, I pray we're able to get there uh, because believing in God does not make you saved. I'll repeat it again. To believe in God is not salvation. You have to believe in his son that he sent for the remission of sin. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying very clearly? And I'm going to show you from scriptures. Because even the devil believes in God. The devil is not saved. So yeah, I, I just believe in God, but I don't just do this church thing. No, 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 sir. No, sir. You cannot, you cannot believe in God by your own terms. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Come on. Are you here? You cannot believe in God. You see, you cannot say you want to worship God and you have your own way you want to worship him. If God says, for instance, forsake not the gathering of yourself together, you cannot say because you've been hurt by church, you don't go to church again, you worship God in your heart. No, sir, you, are not, you cannot do that. Because what we find out is when people are hurt, they now build a theology around their experience. Praise God. You know, people used to say, we should go back to the days of the early church. And I laugh. Go and read, if you read church history, you will not pray that prayer. <laughs> uh, let's go. Let's, let's progress so that we can finish what we're doing here. So you see, go to 1 Peter chapter 1 now. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to read from verse 10. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Man, I... This is so, so, so good. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. Now, let's look at this now. Um, let's see this. Can we go to verse 3? First Peter chapter 1 verse 3. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who according to his great mercy, look at this, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So our being born again is connected to the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. And I have taken my time to always say it in this church, it is not the cross that makes a man saved. Are you following this now? 
Salvation is not that, that Jesus went to the cross. No, there were other thieves on the cross. And, and we need to clarify, that's why the cross is not in a sense a symbol of Christianity. In that sense, but let's not go to the extreme. Because the cross was just a method of killing. And I've said many times, if Jesus was killed by a pistol, what would have been the symbol of Christianity? A gun. All right? <laughs> but, you know, there were other thieves on the cross. Do you remember there were other thieves on the cross? So, the cross is a method of execution. But what actually, what actually brings salvation is the fact that Jesus rose again because the other thieves did not rise. But they were killed. And that is why Christianity is the only way to God because the founder of Christianity in that sense, Jesus, is the only one that lays claim to resurrection. And he lays claim to resurrection in such a way that there are undeniable proofs both physically and spiritually and historically that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Muhammad doesn't lay claim to resurrection from the dead. Buddha doesn't lay claim to resurrection for, to the dead. No other religion lays claim to the fact that their founder, in that sense, rose up from the dead. So, Peter is saying that, blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy, what was that great mercy? John 3, 16, Jesus coming to die for us, has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Through what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ from the dead. So, if you study Pauline theology very well, you will, you will understand that Paul was consistently talking about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Because the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the, the proof that we can be born again. Are you still here? All right. Now, if you go to the Old Testament, for instance, you will see that, uh, I, I want to show you uh, a couple of scriptures. Wow. John, uh, Job chapter 16. Let me show you something here. Job in the Old Testament was crying out. So when you read the book of Job, what comes to your mind most times? The sufferings of Job, right? Uh, come on, church, talk to me. What comes to your mind? How Job suffered. And how Job married one bad woman like that. I said, cause God and die. But, you know... <laughs> What did they say? That the law and the prophets were talking about Jesus. Job chapter 16 verse 19 to 21. Even now, behold, my witness is in heaven and my advocate is on high. Who was Job talking about? Why, why was Job saying this? Who is his advocate? Jesus. Now go to verse 20. My friends are my scoffers. My eye weeps to God. Oh, that a man might plead with God as a man with his neighbor. Now, when you read this now, in the light of what we're teaching, you will see that deep in the heart of Job, Job was referring to and searching for a savior. Who is the man who will plead with God as a man will plead with his neighbor? Who pleaded with God on our behalf so we can be reconciled to God? Jesus. Who is our advocate on high? Jesus. So when you read Job chapter 16, you can see that the cry of Job is the cry of what? Of a redeemer or a savior. Now, if you go to the King James Version in verse 20, you will see the word record. Go, go to, uh, give me the King James Version, Job chapter 16, verse 20, quickly. Job 16, verse 20. I want to show you something so that when you study, it can help you. Now, um, 19, sorry, verse 19, sorry, verse 19. Now, it says, also now, behold, my witness is in heaven and my record is on high. Now, listen to this. When you read the King James Version or the New King James Version and it says, my record is on high. When you read it at face value, what will you think? Huh? Hey, come on now, let's talk. What will you think if, I've not, if we have not read the other translation before? That maybe there were certain things recorded about Job that were kept in high places, right? Now, the, the, now, now because I've heard people say this all the time, <clears throat> we have not finished studying English. If you do it Greek and Hebrew, Greek and Hebrew is not power. No, Greek and Hebrew is not power, it's sense. 
Because that word record in the, Greek, in the Hebrew language is actually not recording like you're writing somebody's records. That word is advocate. Are you following this? That is why, I, no, this is just personal. That's why I started, as I began to study biblical languages, I began to, I, have, I love the New King James a lot. But I began to, you know, f- fall in love clearly. For those of you who followed me for years, discovered that just in the last one year, I started using the New American Standard Bible. Because it's a bit closer in setting translations of the Hebrew and the Greek language. So the, because the King James Version can, can, if you're not careful with the King James, it can mislead your interpretation. And that is why you have to read a particular verse for, from many translations. Now, let me say this now. I don't know what we do with time in this church. Not even started. Let me say this now. People have extremes. They stay with the King James Version or they run straight to the message translation. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? But if you really want to understand the scriptures, you've got to, you know, stay in between the lines somehow. NIV is a, is a perfect translation, very good translation. And don't follow all those things they send on WhatsApp that some verses are missing. This is the translation of the Antichrist. These are for lazy people. Okay? Now, so the word there is advocate. It was referring to Jesus. Okay? Now, it was a cry of Job for a redeemer. Go to Job chapter 9, verse 2. Uh, 932. Let me show you something there again. For instance, if you read the book of Isaiah... And I've heard a lot of teachers teach that, where the scripture says, uh, concerning the works of my hands, command ye me. Have you read that? Have you read that? Come on, have you read that? And you've heard people say, command God concerning the work of his hand. Command God. Even God said, command ye me. Go and read other translations. There's a question mark in front of that. It's saying, concerning the works of my hands. Do you command me concerning the works of my hand? Command ye me? That's the way you should read, not command me. Because the verses before that, he was talking about his sovereignty, the fact that he is God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He's not saying command God. He said, command me. If you read it as prayer point, go and read other translations and see. And read it in context. Don't just pick that verse. Read it in context. You will understand that he was talking about his sovereignty and the fact that you cannot command him concerning the things he's created. Glory to God. Well, that's just homework for you. Where did I say you should turn to? Job chapter what? 9 verse what? Verse 32. Job 9 32. For he is not a man as I am that I may answer him that we may go to court together. Now you see the whole issue of advocacy coming here. Go to Job 15 verse 14. Job chapter 15 verse 14. Please follow this now. It says, What is man that he should be pure? Or he who is born of a woman that he should be righteous? So here Job is questioning the fact that, listen, if we are born in this human way, we cannot be pure. If we're born of a woman, we cannot be righteous. Now, between all of these things that Job is talking about, you can see deep within Job what a cry for a savior. Are you, are you following what I'm saying? What I'm, what I'm just trying to do here is to show you that if we read the scripture with the lenses of Jesus, we will see that even in the prophets and in the Old Testament, people were crying for redemption. They were looking forward to salvation. Let's go back to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, quickly. Wow, 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 wow. Praise God forevermore. First Peter chapter 1. And let, now let's go to verse 10. We started verse 3, but then let's go to verse 10. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that will come to you made careful searches and inquiry. They searched carefully and inquired uh, uh, carefully. Now, what salvation is he talking about here? Is the salvation we read about in verse 3. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, verse, uh, which verse are we now? Verse 11. Seeking to know, look at this, look at this phrase, seeking to know what person, what person, right? Or time 
the spirit of Christ within them was indicated as he predicted, look at this, the sufferings of Christ, which is his suffering and his going to the cross, and what? And the glories to follow. What's the glory to follow? It's the glory of Christ after resurrection. Did you see this? So, if you read the Old Testament, the Bible says that the essential thing in the Old Testament was the fact that they were seeking to know what person, or observe that phrase, what person or time the spirit of Christ within them was indicated as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. So, when we look at that phrase, what person, we now understand what Nathaniel was saying when he said, we have found, in John chapter 1 verse 45, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote Jesus of Nazareth. So when Nathaniel and the rest of them who believed in Jesus saw Jesus, they could know what person or time the Spirit of Christ was indicating. So it's like Isaiah saying, uh, a virgin shall conceive and give birth. Now, what was Isaiah prophesying? Was prophesying the birth of Jesus. Now, when Nathaniel reads that and sees Jesus and put all of those indicators together, he can tell that this is what? The Messiah. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, uh, the word of God says, the seed of the woman, we can read that quickly. Genesis chapter 3, that's the first time Jesus was, was, was referenced. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it says, and I'll put an enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. So we're, we're having two seeds here. Praise God. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now, two things. When he says you shall bruise him on the heel, that is the serpent bruising the seed of the woman on the heel, he was talking about the persecution and the afflictions and the sufferings of Christ which will lead to, uh, to what? To... Um, his crucifixion and his resurrection. Now, if you use the word here, bruise. Now, if you if you look at the original translation, actually, um, he will he shall bruise you on the head. The word there is crush, not bruise, right? And you shall bruise him on the heel. The word there is bruise. Now, two two things, and, and I'll show you the difference here. When he says he shall crush you on the head, he showed the fact that the seed of the woman was going to have ultimate victory over satan jesus did not only just bruise satan jesus ultimately defeated satan are you following what i'm saying so in this place also the king james version got it correctly shall crush and then the serpent shall bruise which talks about the affliction you know most of you think that when jesus was being flogged he took it as god in that sense so the things were not paying him you know i like just flogged me how many 49 we are flogged no no. You know, when he, when he carried that cross, the cross was so heavy that he, he was under the burden of it and a man was asked to help him. So he took that for us. Those were sufferings that he took for our sake. Hallelujah. We know you've been blessed by this telecast. To become a partner, please call plus 234-805- 8887575 Pastor Maxwell's messages are available in over a dozen books and a thousand audio and video format. To purchase this title and other titles by Pastor Maxwell Ogaga, please call plus 234-805-888-7575 or send us an email office at Pastor Maxwell NG. Also available are free downloads from www.thepastormax.ng. God bless you.